Great. Hey, Dan, how are you? Good, Steve, how are you? Good, good. So it uh, gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dan Latour, who is uh, executive director for the Skin Cancer Foundation, uh, who has um, been working with the foundation for many years. He assumed that role as executive director since 2016. Uh, you and I have worked many years, and yes. uh, almost 10 years together. So. I know very well about what the foundation does and all this accomplishment that you have uh, um, sort of implemented, changes you implemented. Mm -hmm. um, love to have you. And again, you know, this is basically for the general public. Uh, one of the things, um, I, I'd love to get your perspective, that is what resources are out there for patients who, let's say, just diagnosed with melanoma? I mean, at this moment, they we, in the book we talked about, you know, the mad rush phase from the time you get diagnosed to the time you get treated. It's a really kind of uh, high anxiety, uh, stressful time. What are resources out there? Sure. Well, I think it, it obviously all depends on on what the patient is is going through and what their doctor is talking to them about. Um, you know, is it is it something that they're just becoming aware of right now? Is it something that they were concerned about? Is it their first time perhaps with melanoma? Is it maybe their third instance of melanoma? Um, so every every patient reacts a little bit differently uh, depending on the news. And um, you know, I think from a resource perspective, it's everything from the immediate, right? Like we always consider physicians the first resource because they're the ones that are explaining things. Uh, at the same time, we also understand that when people are told that they have cancer, Maybe they're not processing everything the same way and they're dealing with the fact that they just were told that they have cancer and they're not listening to the doctor as they explain some of the ins and outs, the details, maybe some of the risk factors and maybe even some of the potential treatments. So our role as, the, as an organization at the Skin Cancer Foundation is to be that backup resource. Sometimes yeah. it might be a brochure, right? Sometimes it might be that the physician themselves hands them a brochure that we wrote that explains this is what melanoma is or some other type of non-melanoma skin cancer. Here's what you need to know. Of course, people then will go back to their car or they'll go back to their apartment and now they're still concerned. They don't remember what the doctor said, so they start to Google things, right? Sure, so sure. We consider ourselves that first stop beyond the doctor where people are going to be impacted the most and they'll end up on our website, which is called skincancer.org. Um, or they'll end up on our social media channels and really start to dive in and learn about what it is that they're going through, more about the disease itself, more about the risk factors, potential treatments, and they can do that at their own pace. They can do it the next day. They can do it a week after. They can share that information with their family or their caregivers, and the idea is to be that support system of credible, medically reviewed information so the patient can get a little bit more peace of mind uh, about their own situation. You, you mentioned something really important. Like a lot of my patients come in and they find things from Google and mm -hmm. uh, Google is great, but right. there's some information just not accurate. And can you comment a little bit about how does your organization kind of validate and sure. make sure the information is accurate? Absolutely. So, you know, it, it's the most important thing we do is credibility for us is paramount. We don't sell products. We don't have a lot of marathons and, and the type of events that, that a lot of nonprofits do. So what we do is we deal in information. So it's super important that everything we do is accurate and correct. Uh, of course, to the limits of what we know, right? I mean, something that we might have said 10 years ago um, may not be exactly the same as it was or that it would be right now. For example, you know, in, in around the year 2000, there were not a lot of treatments no. um, for melanoma. Immunotherapies hadn't really come out yet. Right. But fast forward 20 years, there's lots of new drugs and, and drugs that have been used for the past 10 years. So true and accurate is always a time sensitive type of a, a concept. So that's the most important thing we talk about. But when it comes to medical information, we are either having doctors themselves write it um, or we're having doctors review information. So we here have employees that, you know, um, are in charge of our science and education group. They're in charge of our marketing communications group. We're constantly putting together new information based on voids that we recognize um, through the patients that we work with. And people want to know, I'd like to know more about this, or, you know, I noticed you didn't have something like this available. So we'll go out and find the information through published you know, journals and research studies and things like that. 
piece it together in a user-friendly way. So we're always very good at taking complicated concepts and boiling them down to uh, understandable uh, information. And then we go back to the doctors, whether it be uh, the expert that wrote it in the paper or one of the doctors that works uh, with closely with the foundation like yourself, and we'll ask you and say, look, does this make sense? Is this accurate? Um, sometimes when you boil things down that are complicated, something simple, you lose a little bit of accuracy. And we're always very careful of that. So we work directly with the doctors before we put out anything that's uh, clinical. Um, so I've seen, um, I mean, there's a lot of publication that's coming out. Obviously, one good source is people can go to your website, right? But right. I know that you guys also put out a journal, Skin yes. Journal. But also, there is a melanoma newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, is that still that? That's is yeah. That... It's, it's it's actually we're 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 hoping to redo it. So we had some okay. like the melanoma letter, which was a quarterly newsletter that we did that's right. for years. Uh, we haven't published it since pre-pandemic. It was one of the things that unfortunately was a a casualty of of the pandemic. Um, and we're thinking about different ways to get it out in a in a modern way, right? So. Um, the print publications, there's a lot of challenges with that um, from a cost perspective, from a time perspective, especially when information is so easily transmitted digitally. So we're looking at redoing that, but that's a good example of a, a, a product that we put out there that was intended to educate people, but right from the source. The most One of the most recent ones we did before we ceased publishing it, publishing it um, was an interview with James Allison, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who basically you know started the whole immunotherapy revolution. No, I, I always find, you know, this, you know, this is try to, uh, the project is called Beating Melanoma. This is for right. helping melanoma patients. Of I looked at all the publications and this, the contents you put out. The melanoma letter by far is most in-depth and uh, uh, rich content. Mm -hmm. I would love to have you guys put this back on. And I think maybe after this conversation that we can put together some link and pamphlets so that other folks can go to Absolutely. it and exactly find this. So a couple of things, um, you know, obviously, okay, now, you know, you have a unique position sort of interacting with a lot of experts, right, in this melanoma field. How do you recommend a patient to find the expert? And I mean, the question is, you know, how does, I mean, one of the challenging thing is, uh, how do you get the care, the access, um, and more importantly, how do you know if the patient can trust that physician? They're competent enough to take care of them. Sure. Well, I, I certainly don't want to come across as the expert on how to choose <laughs> a physician, but I think we can share some information on how people can get started. Um, you know, very simply, um, there are several resources available online. Um, you know, when you're talking about melanoma, Right. And, and let's assume we're talking about someone that doesn't they have not been yet diagnosed. Right. Because they're, they're not yet in the system or the pipeline, let's say. Um, if someone is afraid that they have something, um, they should certainly go to a dermatologist first. Right. We always say a board certified dermatologist. Um, I think I would look to see if they have experience with skin cancer. Dermatology, you know, spans uh, across a lot of different areas, everything from acne to rosacea to uh, aesthetics and things like that. So I think we look for someone who specializes in skin cancer, whether it makes, whether it's that they're a Mohs surgeon or they're somehow affiliated with skin cancer um, in a bigger way, or they've written articles related to skin cancer. Um, but I think the number one thing is to first find a dermatologist. Um, general practitioners are a fantastic uh, piece of the puzzle, um, but we know that it's very difficult for them to fully understand what's going on with skin cancer when they're also dealing with a lot of other things. So finding a board certified dermatologist is number one. Um, and you can do that either by going to our website, we have something called our physician finder, where you can go in and type in uh, your zip code and it'll give you people that are in the area, physicians, dermatologists that are in the area. Those are doctors that are affiliated with the foundation in some way. Um, there are also other available links. The American Academy of Dermatology has a very robust uh, list of dermatologists. Again, you can type in your zip code and find people that way. Um, you know, we know that some people are lucky enough to live in areas where there are more dermatologists. So sometimes the New York, the Los Angeles, the Miami, Chicago's of the world, and some people might have to drive a little bit further to find a dermatologist. But I think it's most important that they get to a dermatologist uh, as opposed to maybe, you know, the doctor that just happens to be down the street. Um, so, 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 but what about the people who have already been diagnosed yep. as a melanoma. Yep. 
Well, so the people that have been diagnosed with melanoma, I think the most important thing is for them to, first of all, follow their, their doctor's lead, right? So, yeah. so understanding if, if the dermatologist had already diagnosed them with melanoma, there's so many different things that can happen from that point, right? Is it is it something surgical that happens right there with the dermatologist, depending on how deep the melanoma is? Or is it something where the person's going to have to go a little bit further and maybe go to a surgical oncologist or an oncologist uh, and deal with it another way and start getting into other types of procedures. Um, so it, it's difficult for me to say exactly what they need to do because there are so many different routes that someone could take. But the number one thing is to take action, I think. And it's really, if, if your dermatologist knows that you need to go one step further to make sure that you you know follow that advice, you can, there are certain cancer centers in the United States that are very, very well known, whether it's Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson, uh, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Moffitt Center down in, in Florida. Um, so those are the really big ones. There are certainly very capable uh, medical facilities uh, regionally around uh, in so many local areas. Um, so again, I can't say exactly what they should look for in a doctor other than making sure that they follow the process and do what they're told to do by the initial uh, dermatologist that gives them the diagnosis. And I also would recommend that people get second opinions on things. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And especially it was, um, to make sure that you're you're shopping around and, you, and you're doing the right thing for yourself and self advocating. Um, you know, not that there aren't great doctors everywhere, but I think always understanding what your options are and understanding um, what certain treatment procedures should be is, is really important for patients. No, I think you summarized it very well. I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously listen to your physical dermatologist if you've been diagnosed, right? And then act uh, expediently, don't wait. Uh, and a lot of times, luckily, most melanoma can be easily excised, but there are times when they have advanced stage melanomas, you need this kind of a coordination between these different specialties, right? right? right. No, it's right on, right on. So, <clears throat> Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit, right? And one of the things is um, the people who've been treated, they survived the melanoma, um, and inevitably my patient, find they want to know, like, what can they do both to protect themselves and also somewhat to give back to the community? Sure. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, about like, what is a Skin Cancer Foundation? I know, you know, there's a, you, you provide a research grant, and uh, you provide public education, um, and um, uh, you also validate sunscreen. And it's, you know, you and I work together as a part of the photobiology committee. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about this skin cancer screening mobile service, right? Because you've done this for 15 years, you helped almost 25,000 people, right? And talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I think to, to get started, you know, our, our mission is to save and improve lives. And, and we say it's to save and improve lives because we know that, you know, melanoma can certainly be uh, deadly, right? And we want to deal with it as, as quickly as we can, because uh, the odds are that if you deal with it earlier, you, you know, have usually a, a pretty good prognosis. But it's also to improve lives because it's not just life and death, right? There, there's disfigurement involved. There's all types of different things that, that are involved with skin cancer and melanoma in particular. Um, so we're very careful to say save and improve lives. Um, sure. What we're trying to do with the way we do that is to empower people. Uh, we empower people to take a proactive approach to daily sun protection, to, uh, to early detection, and then also the treatment of skin cancer. So there's kind of those three phases that we work on prevention, early detection, treatment. If you can prevent it, that's number one, right? Do what you can to prevent skin cancer. Wear sunscreen, wear clothing, be in the shade, um, pay attention to what's going on out there and learn about how the sun damages your skin. And that's number one. If you're unfortunate enough to develop skin cancer, it's super important to catch it early, right? So that's where the early detection comes into place, whether it's you find it yourself and you know you go to a dermatologist and say, there's something that I don't like, or you go to an annual screening um, and the dermatologist finds it. We want to catch it as early as we can. And along those lines, one of the things we always tell people, because it's very complicated on what to look for unless you're a trained dermatologist, we tell people to look for anything that's new, changing, or unusual, right? Any type of skin cancer, whether it's melanoma or non-melanoma skin cancer, all falls into one of those three categories. It's either going to be new, it's going to be changing, growing, bleeding, or it's unusual, which is kind of the catch-all for all of it. There's a lot of skin cancer stories we've heard about where people say they just didn't like something. 
right? It, it wasn't, it didn't fit any particular category of an ABCDE of melanoma. They just didn't like it and they pursued it and they went to a dermatologist and it turned out to be something. Um, so that's early detection. And then the treatment, right? And, and you said it earlier, it's about prompt the treatment. The longer you wait, the worse things get. And there's almost never um, an instance where waiting is a good thing. So it's go get prompt treatment, learn things, get on the internet, understand, ask questions, look at brochures and articles and understand what's happening. So you have that peace of mind of, of knowing what your journey is going to look like. So prevention, early detection, treatment. Beyond that, the foundation has programs that fall into each of those categories. Okay, so a lot of what we do for prevention has to do with things like the seal of recommendation, which is what you know started our relationship. Uh, the seal of recommendation goes on sun protection products um, that meet certain criteria. Um, they are uh, reviewed by our photobiology committee, which you know, if anybody doesn't know, Dr. Wong is uh, the chair of our photobiology committee and has been you know for years. Um, and been involved with the foundation, by the, the foundation even longer than that. Um, so the photobiology committee will review the data on this testing and uh, decide if it meets the criteria. So that's the seal recommendation. And we consider that an educational program because if you go into any store anywhere, you're gonna see the seal recommendation on sunscreens. And the idea is to remind people that the sunscreens are there to protect you, right? It's not to make you more tan or to tan in a nicer way. The sunscreen should be protecting you. So that's the seal recommendation that has more than a hundred different products, or sorry, a hundred different companies in there, maybe up to a thousand products within those hundred companies. So it's vast and that's- been Yeah, yeah I, I know, I know. I, I, I review them. I think I'm getting a batch, <laughs> another batch from so. Stephanie soon. But go on, keep going. For, for anybody that's watching, we owe Dr. Moy a big debt of gratitude. No, for no, no, no. Go on, keep going, keep going. Talk, know, about, right? talk about some other programs, yeah. We're having fun. Um, so if we move beyond prevention, right? And there's a lot of things beyond the seal. We always talk about the importance of reapplication of sunscreen, right? So putting on sunscreen isn't enough. You have to put on enough. And then you have to put it on multiple times throughout the day if you're out for long periods of time. Um, there's so many different things we can talk about with prevention, just understanding how clothing work and things like that. Let me, uh, let me, let me, let me stop you for a second. Um, Wait, for those of you who do not know, Dan has actually uh, played uh, NFL football for Detroit and uh, he's a big football player. Did you use sunscreen when you were uh, playing? I'm going to say yes, but we're talking about almost 30 years ago. So uh, I did certainly didn't know what I knew uh, now, but uh, I can tell you that football players do get uh, a particular tan that sure. you notice um, where their pads, their football pads stop up here and in other things and where their pants stop in the back of their necks. So with the, the training rooms did have sunscreen. It was not as prevalent as it is now. Um, I think more and more players are using it. And for, for sure, you'll see coaches. Now, whenever you see coaches out in the field, they wear big hats. Um, a lot of them are wearing long sleeve shirts. Uh, so it is catching on in the world of sports for sure, because people are starting to recognize uh, the, the, the damage that can be done in the sun. Sean McDermott, who's the head coach of the Buffalo Bills, works with us to get the messaging out. Right oh, that's now, great. He's, yeah, he's got that's a big great. hat on all the time. Um, so, so football is, is learning. Um, but, but uh, hold on a second. Um, one thing, because you know, sure. young boys, um, yes. teenagers, fearless, right? And the idea of preventing sunscreen that's totally for preventing skin cancer is totally like sort of not, not something in their mind. Correct. And your son is playing it's in West Point, playing football, right? Right. right. Is Jack um, using sunscreen? Do you tell him to use sunscreen? I, I do, and and he did. I'd like to think that he is right now. Again, I don't get to see him too often while he's up at West Point, and sure. my older son, TJ, plays football at Delaware, uh, and I can say that I know he does. Um, maybe not every single time and every single day, but but he has made it a part of his, uh, his routine um, because he grew up with it. I've been with the foundation okay. for 16 years, yeah. and my oldest son being 20 years old, they've been, you know, surrounded by this information for a long period of time. So, so they both know that, you know, when they're out running around, they need to protect themselves. They wear long sleeves. Uh, you know, someone might find a picture of them online where they're not wearing long sleeves. You know, they're not perfect, uh, but they understand. And I think we're starting to see that more and more. Like I said earlier, the training rooms are starting to realize it. That's the amazing. Starting to look at it more as, as a part of their overall health, just like nutrition and conditioning and weightlifting. Um, I think people are starting to realize that there are other aspects to health beyond, you know, what the obvious are. So, yeah, I, I mean, um, uh, for those who are listening and we, I'm going to interview two other experts about sunscreen. We can talk all day about sunscreen, yes. but, but right. coming back, you know, sure. um, 
And, and you mentioned all these different programs, and uh, you haven't touched upon the uh, the mobile right. service. Right. right. How do is there is there, is this is this bus coming out again during the summer? The next summer? It is. It is. Okay. So basically, what we're talking about it's called Destination Healthy Skin. It's, okay. Uh, it's an RV. It's a forty foot RV that uh, is customized and equipped with two exam rooms, a waiting room in the middle, basically like a traveling doctor's office, so to speak. Uh, and we drive around the country for four to five months every summer uh, where local dermatologists volunteer their time. They come out to the RV and perform uh, free skin cancer screenings. Um, so there's a lot to it. There's the screenings themselves. So we know that we're screening people and we know we're finding lots of skin cancers and we know that we're saving lives. I could go on and on about the number of people where we found melanomas. They had, you know, had them treated. They had no idea they had a melanoma. So we know we're saving lives that way. How does, um, how, I mean, I think people, you mentioned before, like folks who are living in the major cities, that's relatively easy to access their dermatologist. And does this, does this mobile um, screening um, bus, and can people find, is this just an itinerary that people can yeah. find it? Okay. Yeah, so what, what we, we build out an itinerary well in advance and we start recruiting the dermatologist to volunteer their time. So we actually, on our website, again, skincancer.org, Okay. Um, it's called Destination Healthy Skin. We have the whole thing mapped out where it's like, here are the cities that we'll go to. Again, we don't right. have the 2023 schedule up yet. We will in a few months. Okay. Uh, we're working on that now. But the itinerary is built out. There'll be the date, the location, the times. Um, and we come out and, and we do these screenings. I think the important thing for people to understand with it is we're not doing biopsies on the spot, right? So, okay. so we're doing the screenings. If a doctor finds something that's unusual, they'll you know fill out all the forms that they need to, give them to that patient, and they expect the patient to follow up with a dermatologist. It might be the dermatologist that's doing the screening themselves. They can set up an appointment. It might be a different dermatologist, but the important thing is that they're walking away knowing that they need something checked. We have been in situations where doctors have almost deemed it an emergency and said, call my assistant, get in my office, wow. tomorrow, I'm going to see you right away. Well, so I think, I mean, this service is situation. really helpful. I mean, I think once we get off the phone and get off this uh, call, and I'm going to definitely add a link uh, to it so that people have access to it. I know we're winding down and we can talk all day. I mean, right. a couple more hours after this. So what do you... What do you say to someone right now who have, let's say, just recently been diagnosed with melanoma, right? And they're sort of in the thick of all this stuff. And what do you say to them? I would say continue to gather as much information as you can. I would say continue to ask questions of the people in your medical team. Um, and I would say don't be afraid to, to look for support. Don't be afraid to go out there. There are a lot of uh, uh, support groups that are out there that can Kind of offer different help that you might not even be thinking about. Uh, there are a lot of resources that are available out there. We have a, a section of our website that has consolidated resources from all different organizations beyond okay. our, to help make things uh, easy for you to find because we as an organization are an educational organization and we do everything we can to help people, but we're not sending out money for people to pay for meals while they're in treatment or we're not necessarily helping people offset rent or pay for some of the, the drugs that they need, um, maybe if they can't afford them. Um, but there are resources out there. So we have created lists where people can go, whether it's emotional support, financial support, transportation support, that's all available. So I would say, understand as much as you can about the, your own situation and, and what your journey is gonna look like. Um, but then also don't be afraid to go out there and, and ask for help from other people that have been through it. And it might be as simple as going onto our Facebook page, um, you know, Skin Cancer Org, because we have 70,000 people that are on there sharing their experiences. And whether oh, that is so helpful. I mean, I think I, it will be, it will be, I'm sure there's probably like survivor stories that you will inspire Absolutely. folks, right? And, Absolutely. Um, there, there's a lot of advice, not necessarily medical advice. You don't want to be taking medical no, advice from no. random people on social media. But, but sometimes they make you look at something a little bit different or somebody shares their experience and you have that aha moment and it really helps you along. So I would just suggest gather as much information as you can. Again, keeping your medical team as your core advisors, um, but then looking for support in other places. And I think, you know, letting family members and friends help is another key thing. I think a lot of people keep it to themselves and, and don't like to share their, their concerns. And, you know, a lot of times people might have a Band-Aid or a surgical scar or something like that. And people will say, oh, it's nothing. 
I think it's okay to share what you've gone through because you might end up saving a life yourself. Someone else might not know. Yeah, that is the most powerful thing. And I think that's the one one of the reasons a lot of people want to help after they survive through the process. Last okay. question for you. Yes, sure. Uh, I know the foundation has gone through a lot of transformation under your leadership. Mm -hmm. What is coming around the corner in the next five years? What do you guys aim to do? Um, I think I think one of the biggest things that we're working on is trying to change behaviors. If if you can, yeah, that is really difficult. Yeah. Right, I yeah. always say that knowledge does not translate to behavior. But sorry That's to right. interrupt you. No, 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 you're you're absolutely right. And I know yeah. we, we talked about that with with you know having sunscreen at having people put it on when they brush their teeth, right, and and how long it takes to develop a habit. But I think you know when the foundation was was started in 1979, nobody had any information about anything. There was not a lot of information about skin cancer. There was not a lot of information about sunscreen or prevention or any of that sort of thing. And over the years, you know, as as information became more available and studies more studies came out about different treatments and prevention methods, even sun protection and UVA, right? Yeah. You know, we've known really about UVA protection for the last 15 years or maybe 20 years. Um, from from a from a layperson's perspective, being able to have enough information to share, so that has all shifted. But I think there's enough information out there. It doesn't mean we're going to stop providing information. But when we talk about where we can be most impactful, it's to change behaviors, whether it's to make sure that people are using more sun protective products, whether it be sunscreen or clothing or umbrellas or awnings, or re reapplication or that sort of thing, or if it's taking action when they do see something that's new, changing, unusual, and not just keep looking at it for three months, hoping it goes away, right? And I think that's the behavior change we're talking about is, is putting programs and resources in place that help people become empowered to take care of themselves, right? It is, is That's the biggest thing that we see across all healthcare right now is you're your best advocate. No matter what you're, what you're doing, whether it's financial, health, relationships, you have to take control of yourself. And we're trying to create a situation where we give people a little push in that direction to take the lead uh, for their own lives. Because there's 350 million people in the United States right now, give or take, I'm probably off by a few thousand, right? But you can't do everything for everybody. People have to do for themselves. And we see ourselves as playing a big role in that space. Fantastic. I mean, I think uh, this is an absolutely great direction because um, um, changing behavior is very difficult. Sometimes knowledge doesn't help. It's the little tiny habit environment that plays a role. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned 350 pe million people in America, but I know that Skin Cancer Foundation work with the international community you have much, much wider reach. So Dan, uh, I really, really want to thank you for your time. And uh, we will put a whole bunch of links underneath this video uh, for the screening program, for the support program, and anything else that you want to share with me uh, will be, will be, uh, will be ready to go. Great. Yeah, I would, I would just you know finish by saying if there are any questions, skincancer.org is the website with all the resources. Uh, you can email us at info at skincancer.org. Um, and again, check out our social media channels. We're very easy to find, and there's a lot of great information coming out, you know, several times a day across all different social media. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share. I appreciate everything you've done for the foundation uh, as an individual, and uh, you know, look forward to doing what we can to help people. Wonderful. All right, you have a good day. Talk to you. Thank soon. you, Steve. Bye. Bye.